Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. Our top story this Friday evening, President Donald Trump today speaking out about his decision to authorize an airstrike against Qassam Soleimani. And now the Pentagon is scrambling to reinforce the American military presence in the Middle East in preparation for retaliation. Over the past two decades, Soleimani had assembled a network of heavily armed allies. The killing of him marks a major escalation in the standoff between Washington and Iran, which can date back to President Trump withdrawing from the 2015 nuclear deal. Trump says his decision to strike was to protect those overseas. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. But in Iran, Soleimani was seen as a national hero, and Iranian officials are vowing revenge. Around 5,200 American troops are based in Iraq, and thousands of additional troops will now be deployed to the Middle East. Having worked, lived, and traveled extensively in Iran, the head of a nonprofit assisting refugees and immigrants says the situation there isn't unexpected. Jesse DeGoyado says this former San Antonio pastor believes Iran has been more of a threat to the Middle East itself than the United States. So they're portraying him, of course, as a national hero and a martyr. Fluent in Persian, Dr. Mark Pfeiffer has been following Iranian state media coverage of General Qasim Soleimani's assassination. So they're happy that he's gone, but they're also, it hurts their national pride, too. Despite the fact he says that Soleimani was hated by most Iranians. I imagine they're very, very torn feeling both things at once. Yet he says Iran has been looking for a fight by attacking American assets in the region. We've been restrained, but that restraint can only go so far. Iranian proxy storming the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was the last straw, he says, leading to the airstrike that kills Soleimani. They have to know that there are lines they can't cross and that we will respond. Still, Pfeiffer says he fears those he's met in Iran over the years and other innocent lives could be lost if there's a military conflict. Doubtful, he says, since Iran knows it can't win, given most of the region would stand with the U.S. But that doesn't mean there can't be acts of sabotage and hit and run attacks by Iran against American interests. And we might see that happen. But I'm, I don't really anticipate a major regional war over something like this. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. Back here at home, he runs what is arguably one of the biggest law firms in town. We're talking about the district attorney, D.A. Joe Gonzalez, who just wrapped up his first year in that office. Talk to our Paul Venema about what he says are his accomplishments and disappointments. Let me reintroduce myself. I am Joe Gonzalez. I am your Bear County district attorney. <laughs> When he won the election in 2018, attorney Joe Gonzalez knew one thing for certain. I knew that we were going to have to hit the ground running. It was, for the most part, starting from the ground up by making changes with the way the office is administered. One of my concerns was bringing criminal justice reform to Bear County, and, and I believe that we're doing that. Among the things he's most proud of is implementation of the site and release program, which was done with a major buy-in from law enforcement. We've had close to a thousand people avoid being arrested and being instead referred to the reentry center for the small amount of, of drug cases like marijuana. 1,166 to be exact. Addressing family violence is another priority. The number of cases currently pending review is at 1,100. Gonzalez says his staff has cut that number in half since last January. They had a huge backlog that they inherited that they've reduced uh, significantly. The downside of what he's facing, Gonzalez says, is money. Obviously, again, uh, budget is always the issue here. If we had more prosecutors, we could do a better job. Overall, he says, it's been a challenging year. It is uh, what I envision and, and more. Perhaps Gonzalez's biggest challenge still lies ahead. His staff has four high-profile cases, including a death penalty case, set for trial in the next six weeks. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News.
San Antonio police still looking for a south side man who escaped during a standoff last night. It happened around 10 at an apartment complex on Emerald Ash near Loop 410. Police were told that an intoxicated man was firing shots down to the ground from the balcony after fighting with his girlfriend. When they got there, they found the suspect had run to a different apartment. Officers were unable to get him to come out. That standoff lasted about an hour and a half. The suspect was able to sneak out of a window during that time. Police did recover a weapon. Police arrested this man, 17-year-old Christopher Rodriguez, who is accused of burglarizing two stores within 30 minutes. The incidents happened early Sunday morning. Rodriguez is accused of first stealing from a cricket wireless on Old Pearsall Road near Miller's Pond Park around 4 a.m. He was then caught on camera inside the store taking money from the register. The other incident was at a different cricket wireless on Nogalito Street. Bear County Emergency Services District 5 is fighting part of a 2200 acre annexation by the city of San Antonio. Much of the newly annexed parts of the south side properties were in the ESD's taxing area. The district provides fire and EMS services to small municipalities and unincorporated areas in corners of Bear County. The ESD, which called the annexation illegal and improper in a lawsuit, says the loss of tax revenue affects its ability to provide services to the remaining part of its district. It's a dangerous job. Um, it's a dangerous position. And uh, to be able to protect them, it takes money. And provide them the equipment and the means necessary to provide their service. A trial date has been set for February 24th in this case. In the meantime, the two sides have been sent to mediation. Around Texas tonight, the fight for baby Tinsley's right to life continues today as the Texas governor and attorney general show their support for an emergency stay. In a letter to the second appeals court, they urge the court to grant an emergency stay until the latest appeal by the family is resolved. In part, the letter says, quote, this case presents a life or death decision. The right to life and the guarantee of due process are of the utmost important, not only to baby Tinsley and her family, but to all Texans, end quote. Baby Tinsley has been on life support for almost a year now due to a rare heart defect. This week, a judge ruled in favor of the hospital to take her off life support due to her being in pain. But her mother disagrees. One person is dead and three others injured after a stabbing attack this morning in Austin. It happened at a shopping plaza there. Austin police say the suspect attacked a person inside of a coffee shop before then moving on to a free birds restaurant a few doors down and stabbing two people there. It's unclear if the victims were free birds employees. They've not been identified. The victim who died is described as a man in his 20s. Witnesses saw the whole thing. I don't think it's uh, anyone's okay after seeing that. And I just am grateful that the man who was in the shop, that he's okay. Um, that was really scary. And, um, I, but I feel, you know, sad that everything ended the way that it did. This is the first homicide in the city of Austin this year. A Thursday night rollover crash on State Highway 123 leads to the death of two people in San Marcos. The victims have been identified as 52-year-old Daniel Aguilar and 55-year-old Raymond Silguero. Police say a Honda Accord was traveling northbound when it veered to the right and hit a driveway culvert and rolled. Both occupants were not wearing their seatbelts and were ejected. The Senate is back in session following their holiday recess, and it appears they are no closer to coming to an agreement on allowing witnesses to testify at the impeachment trial. The standoff in the Senate, even as House Democrats are in court seeking access to a key witness, ABC's Serena Marshall reports tonight from Washington. In the U.S. Senate, it's business as usual. So for now, we're content to continue the ordinary business of the Senate while House Democrats continue to flounder. As the question of whether the articles of impeachment will be forwarded remains in a standoff. It's the Senate's turn now to render sober judgment as the framers envisioned. But we can't hold a trial without the articles. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is refusing to forward the articles of impeachment to the Senate until she knows the rules for the trial. McConnell holding firm, saying they should stick to the parameters of the Clinton impeachment, only turning to the question of witnesses after opening statements and logistics have been addressed. But his Democratic counterpart in the Senate argued, Never, never in the history of our country has there been an impeachment trial of the president in which the Senate 
was denied the ability to hear from witnesses. The tit-for-tat stalemate comes as a federal court hears arguments from House Democrats who want to compel former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify in the impeachment inquiry. Well, in New York, Lev Parnas, an associate of Rudy Giuliani's who allegedly played a key role in assisting him in his efforts to dig up dirt on former Vice President Joe Biden in Ukraine, has been granted permission to share key materials with House investigators. This isn't the first time Lev Parnas shared data with impeachment investigators. Back in November, he provided them with photos and videos that included Giuliani and President Trump. In the past, House lawyers have said if they received new evidence, they could bring new articles of impeachment against the president. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. Back here at home, time saver traffic. Let's take a look at the camera here at I-10 in Frio. Normally, it's backed up this time of day as people head especially into downtown, but things moving smoothly in both directions this evening. No real trouble spots to tell you about. The South Texas RV Super Sale is happening this weekend. In fact, it's underway right now at the Expo Hall at the Freeman Coliseum. Dozens of vendors are ready to sell what current and future RVers need to hit the road. We talked with a couple of shoppers to get their take on what they saw. Just the amenities, like I said, and the affordability of the motorhomes. Like, that's one thing I didn't expect. They're always impressive. They're, I mean, they're absolutely beautiful uh, coaches. Uh, and Sarah really represents uh, um, a lot of beautiful motorhomes. But there's so many, so many vendors here and so many motorhomes. This is wonderful. The RV show continues tomorrow and Sunday, starting at 10 a.m.